I would like to invite you as we prepare for this message to just think about some of the eternal truths of Scripture, specifically some of the prayers from the Psalms. Won't you bow with me? I lift up mine eyes unto the hills. I look all around and wonder, from where is our help to come? Our help comes from the Lord, the God, the maker of heaven and earth. Lord, you have been our dwelling place, our home, our abode for all time. Since before these mountains were brought forth, from everlasting to everlasting, for all time, you are God. God, you are our refuge and strength, a mighty fortress. Therefore, we will not fear. Create in us a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within us. And may the words of my mouth and may the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And all God's children said, Amen. A couple of years ago, I was visiting with a college student I didn't know real well. I had met her on campus but we got a chance to share at a table a cup of coffee. And she asked me, now what brought you to Williamsburg? And I was talking about that. And I said, well, what brought you to the University of the Cumberlands? And she said, well, I applied to and visited nine different schools. I was like, wow, I'm nearly 50. And back then, you looked at one or two. Man, she applied and visited. I said, goodness gracious. And she said, yeah, and I got into each of them. And so she had nine choices. I said, what were you looking for? And she said, well, I played sports, and so I wanted to play, if I could, varsity or JV. I wanted to go to a place where there would be some, she was a a strong Christian. She wanted to go to a place where there were Christian organizations. And she said, so I looked at every one of those, and then I just had this feeling. And I just knew that this is the place I was supposed to go. I was like, really? And she said, yeah, I just, all of that stuff... And I just knew deep down. I think some of the more significant and consequential decisions we make in our lives are not made by taking a piece of paper and drawing a line down the middle of it and putting plus on one side and minus on the other and listing it out. Now, that's, that can be all right. I mean, that's okay. But some of the most consequential decisions occur when we just know. And what I told this student is... I think you were being called to this place. And she was a believer, still is, a very devout Christian, and she would say that's true, that God's Spirit was guiding her and directing her. I think this happens to us many, many times in life, and some of the most important decisions happen that way. One of the privileges of being a pastor is you get to do premarital counseling with couples and you get to visit with them and do the wedding and all that stuff. And I invariably, one of the first questions I ask is, now tell me the story of how you came to know this is the one, okay? Nobody ever tells me they pulled out a piece of paper and drew a line down the middle of it or said, you know, I looked around and men are like parking places, all the good ones are taken. No, I mean, no, she, nobody does that. It, it's, it, but it's hard to describe the story of how you began to know that this is the one, It's easier to explain to me why you pull for University of Kentucky over the University of Tennessee. Or easy to explain, well, this is why I vote as a Republican, or this is why I vote as a Democrat. It's easier to say, well, this is why I chose this career, or this is why I chose that career. When I ask a couple, tell me about your story of how you came to love one another, always there comes a shyness and stories being told. And eventually, something like we just knew this had to be what we would do. And in many, many cases, most cases that I've been involved in or that I've witnessed, I could say, I think that was the Holy Spirit guiding you and directing you. That was God calling you, if you will, into this relationship and leading you. You know, if a couple ends up having children... Chances are they didn't make a rational decision about it. Here's what I mean. You don't have children to secure your financial future. You don't have children to ensure better sleep at night. Chances are there was a time when you had a conversation 
And you had been just happy and in bliss, and it had been a long, 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 long honeymoon, and eventually something was telling you there is more to life than this. Why don't we share? That's kind of what typically happens. My family, 14 years ago, became foster parents. It was not a rational decision. We got to know the need in our community. We lived in North Carolina at that time. We got to know the needs in our community, and we got to know some of the people and some of the children and some of the situations, and we began to pray about it. And all of a sudden, we didn't have to do pluses and minuses. We knew this is what we have to do. And I would say we were being called, that God's Spirit was inviting us to participate that way. You, you do these things all the time in your life. You do it when you're at school and you see someone being picked on and you decide you want to say something and so you stand up. You don't make the pluses and minuses and weigh it out. You stand up for your friend, right? You do this in your families when somebody needs some help. You, you drop what you're doing for a family member or for a neighbor to say, I will help. Sometimes you drop what you're doing and you change your plans in life to take care of a child or to take care of children or to take care of nieces and nephews or some kind of loved one. And what I would say is oftentimes what you're doing is you're responding to God's call and the nudge of God's Spirit for you to share the love that He has given you. And so I want you to think about the fact that I believe with all of my heart that every person in this room right now is being called in some way to serve God. Sometimes we think the callings happen upon graduation. And it happens when you meet that someone, or it happens when you turn 40, or it happens when you're 65, or you make this choice and you follow the call. I think you are being called right now, all of us are being called to take steps of obedience and service to God, to give Him glory in our relationships. And sometimes that may mean going to the other side of the world. Sometimes it might mean being where you are and paying attention where you are. Keaton read a hard calling story in the Gospels. There are five of them that the Gospels share, the synoptic Matthew, Mark, and Luke share, there are five stories where Jesus uses the word, follow me or come to me. They're spread out, and I want to just talk to you about a couple of them because I think when we're trying to respond to God's call in our lives, I think we can learn so much from others who have been called by, by Jesus. The first one I want to mention is, and, and I'm going to walk through just a couple of them in the Gospel of Mark before we get to the Luke passage. But in Mark, the very first chapter, Jesus has been baptized. He begins preaching this gospel of repentance. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Turn from whatever you're doing and turn toward God with your life. And for some people, that's a 180. For some people, it's a 110. For some people, it's a 45. <laughs> turn wherever you're facing and turn toward God, Jesus said. Maybe Andrew and Simon and James and John had heard that preaching in their community. Jesus' fame was spreading. Maybe they had heard Jesus issue that call to turn with all that you have toward God. We, we don't really know. All we have are the verses in the Scripture where Jesus walks along the Sea of Galilee and he says, follow me, follow me. And he says to Peter and to Andrew, he says, you have been all your life fishing for perch and bass. Follow me. I want to teach you to fish for people. Follow me. Goes on further down the road, not the road, down the shore. James and John, brothers. Peter and Andrew leave their nets and they follow. James and John are there with the hired hands and the boats and their father. I mean, that was a thriving small business, right? Family business. Follow me. Follow me. And for whatever reason, they dropped what they were doing, and they followed Jesus. Um, not a rational choice. There's plenty of that throughout Scripture. But here it is just an understanding that I'm being called to a different and a deeper place. Jesus was going to transform what they were doing with their lives. You've been feeding people for a day. You can feed people for eternity if you follow me and you and you introduce people to me. 
One chapter later, Jesus walks into a tax booth, and there is Levi, a guy who is a tax collector, and he has been, up until this point, serving the kingdom of Caesar, serving the Roman Empire, and tax collectors were absolutely hated. You know, in Scripture, often you hear the tax collectors and sinners, the sinners and the tax collectors, because you know what they were? They were Jews who were taking money from other Jews, oftentimes lining their pockets with it, and they were giving it to Rome. It would be like me saying, if I'm an elected official or president going to Benedict Arnold and saying, Benedict Arnold, I want you to be my right-hand man. Crazy. Jesus says to Levi, follow me. And you know what? You've spent your life serving Caesar, and you've spent your life pursuing the Roman Empire. Let's see what it's like to serve the King of Kings and to serve in the kingdom of God. The Roman Empire is going to not last forever. No empires do. A couple of hundred years, and it's going to change. It's hard for us to imagine this experiment with democracy will not last forever. And Jesus says, follow me. And Levi drops his stuff. Jesus didn't catch him on a coffee break. He didn't say, after April 15th, follow me. He said, follow me. And Levi dropped what he was doing, and he followed to serve in a kingdom that would and does and has lasted. One more story, just a few more chapters later in the ninth chapter, Jesus meets the rich young ruler. Now, that's a guy who has it all. Wealth, youth, and power. Is there anything else you could want? Rich young ruler. But here's what he wanted. How can I have eternal life? How can I inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, well, you know what the Scriptures say? The Scriptures say, don't kill. The Scriptures say, don't steal. Don't lie. Don't covet. Don't commit adultery. Honor your father and your mother. And he says, well, I've kept all of these since my youth. And that's where Jesus looks at him and says, you lack one thing. Go and sell everything that you have and give the money to the poor and then come follow me. Now, this one didn't end up as neat and tidy as Peter and Andrew and James and John because the rich man was hanging on to a whole lot of stuff. Now, this is really easy for us to make it talking about somebody else. Raise your hand if you're rich. Right. Who's rich? The person who has one more dollar. I'm not going to say point to somebody who's rich. It's about somebody else, right? But I can tell you a third of the world lives on two dollars a day. We're all in the 90th percentile most likely. We understand that. The, the problem with this man was he trusted in his riches. That's what gave him his identity. He, he, he couldn't surrender what he had to Jesus. He couldn't accept that Jesus would give him his identity. Now, we may not be rich, and some of us would definitely say we're not. But what are those things that we cling to, that we hold on to, that give us our identity, that give us our comfort, those places where we are reluctant to offer our trust in Jesus Christ. That person was given an invitation to follow, and he couldn't and wouldn't do it. The last one is the one that Keaton read for us. And, and this is hard. Going along the road and someone says, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, you know, if you're looking for the comfortable way, if you're looking for the security of a home, the security of a family, the security of a place, you're not going to find it here. All you can do is follow me. That's a hard word. That's a hard word. The next person Jesus encounters, Jesus says, follow me. And the person says, wait, let me just bury my father. Now, if there is anything as a universal excuse that goes in any circumstances, if you lose your close loved one like a parent, you're always excused, right? Commentators have tried to soften this, saying, well, you know, it's very possible that this man's father had not just died, 
that there wasn't a dead body that was going to be buried in one day and he wasn't on his sick bed. It's very possible that this was like an older son in the family who's like, well, you know, when my father lives his life out and when he dies, then I'll come and follow, making it where we're really talking about a long time. I, you know, I, I just, there's no way to soften what Jesus has said. When he said, follow me, he meant anything that is in your hands and before your body and in your life is second place to following Jesus right here, right now. And the third one, he said, I'll follow you, Jesus, but let me first say goodbye to my family and those I love. And Jesus doesn't make it easy. He says, how in the world can you look back and plow a straight line forward? And that's a hard lesson in life to learn. Life is meant to be lived this direction. Jesus' command it bears immediate, immediate response. What if it's true that each of us right now is being called in this room? And I really believe it is. What if, what if right now all of us are being called to follow more closely with our lives? What if Jesus says, like he said to Peter and Andrew, this is what you've been doing, but, and I've given you that gift, and that's what you've prepared your whole life to do, but we're going to turn that into something more. Follow me. What if... Jesus is calling you. You've invested in things that are important, like to Levi. It's a respected trade, depending on how you look at it. But I want you to follow me into something that lasts for all time. What if Jesus is calling you and you, you say, well, but I, here's what my identity has been. I'm comfortable with this, like the rich young ruler. I'm, I'm comfortable here. That, that's who I am. That, that's what I've been. My name, our place, our stuff. And Jesus says, take it all, sell it, and give it to the poor, and come follow me. I, d I do want to point out, that is often in Scripture as Jesus says to come follow and sends people off in the distance, go there to the entire world, just as often he says, go home. And what he means is go home and tell your family, go back to your village and tell them what I've done. Just as often he does that. Perhaps Jesus is telling you, embrace me fully in the life that you have and in the choices that you have made, embrace me here and now. And what if Jesus is calling you and calling me and saying follow, but we have different excuses? There's something pressing. I need to say goodbye. I want to tidy this up. And Jesus says, right now, this is more important than anything, anything else. I believe... Jesus is calling you and to me in steps of devotion, in, in steps of discipleship, into places of service and witness. And it is urgent that we respond today. And so the question, I guess, that I have for you is how will you respond to that call? How will you respond? The invitation is there. How will you respond? Won't you pray with me? Heavenly Father, for this moment and this morning, we are so very thankful. I thank you for each person that you have brought into this sanctuary today. I pray, Lord, that you would shine your light upon our lives so that we might understand more fully your goodness and all that you offer I pray that you would touch each heart and that you would guide us to be more faithful stewards of all the blessings we know, that you would guide us to be more grateful for the things that you have given. I 
pray that you would guide us to be more generous with, with our gifts. I ask that you would help us to be more joyful in our service of you. And I ask you to bless each one gathered here today in a powerful way. And I ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our hymn of commitment today is hymn number 581, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. One of the small groups that's going on at the church right now is called The Good and Beautiful Life. And it invites everyone to take more steps on their journey of faith. And one of the questions in the previous chapter that we've, the group that I've been in has been looking at is the question that says, you know, what would be the cost of following Jesus? And so you talk about that as a group. And then the next question is, what's the cost of not following Jesus? And I couldn't help but think about all of these individuals here who were invited to not just feed people for a day, but for a lifetime, not invited to just serve a kingdom that was going to end, but one that lasts forever, not just invited to hold on tightly to stuff, but to embrace Jesus. That's what we lose if we don't answer now. And so won't you sing hymn number 581, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. And if you have a decision you'd like to make, use this time. If you want to make it public, I'll be here to receive you. But sing this as a prayer, as a hope in your life. Let's stand and sing hymn number 581. The psalmist said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I feel that way about this morning. I hope you do as well. We've heard some beautiful singing and some powerful truth and some encouraging words. And so I hope that you'll take a moment to just welcome someone who is here. I know we're from a lot of different congregations, but you know we're in this place this morning right now. And I'm reminded, I grew up in Mississippi, and in my grandmother's church, when you left the parking lot, the the front of the sign said, Welcome to North Greenwood Baptist Church. The back of the sign said, When you leave, you are now entering the mission field. And so whether this is your home church, or whether you worship in another place regularly, we leave this place, all of us, um, those of us who follow Jesus Christ, out into the world as his witnesses, as his missionaries, as those who've been charged with sharing that good news. Um, So I want to remind you of that, and won't you bow with me before we go. As you leave this place today, I invite you to live simply and to care deeply, to love generously, to forgive freely, and to pray daily. And as you do these things, place your lives into the hands of a gracious and merciful God who loves you very much. Amen.